warm welcome to all the participants who have logged in today from across the world. We look forward to engaging with you to enrich today's discussions. To put in your questions to our speakers, you can add them in the chat box below and we will pose your questions to the speakers. With this, I'd like to introduce the host and speakers for the day, host Dr. Shelley Johnny and the speakers Ambassador Venu Rajamani and Professor Harsh Pant. Ambassador Venu Rajamani has been the ambassador of India to the Netherlands, a permanent, represent, permanent representative of India to the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, and was responsible for India's relations with the International Court of Justice and the Permanent Court of Arbitration. He was a member of the Indian delegation before the ICJ in the Jaghav case and a co-agent of India in the Enrique Alexi case before the Permanent Court of Arbitration. He was also the press secretary to the Indian president, Pranab Mukherjee. He has served as the joint secretary and head of the multilateral institutions division in the DEA in the finance ministry from 2010 to 2012, and he, where he was responsible for formulating India's policies towards the IMF, World Bank, and IFAD. He uh, currently is a professor of diplomatic practice at the Jindal Global Law School of the OP Jindal Global University, Sonipat, Haryana. He has just recently been appointed as Kerala's, Kerala government's OSD for external cooperation and will lies with the Ministry of External Affairs, foreign missions in New Delhi, Chennai, Bangalore, and diplomatic missions abroad on various matters. He is an advisor to CPPR. Our second speaker for the day is Professor Harsh Pant. He is the Director for Studies and the Head of the Strategic Studies Program at the Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. He also holds a joint department with the Department of Defense Studies and the King's India Institute as a Professor of International Relations at the King's College of London. Um, amongst many other laurels, he is a non-resident fellow with the Vadwani Chair in the US-India Policy Studies at the CSIS Center for Strategic Stud and International Studies in Washington, DC. His current research focuses on Asian security issues. He writes extensively on foreign policy issues for the Japan Times, the Wall Street Journal, the National UAE, the Hindustan Times, and the Telegraph. And he is the author of several books like India's Nuclear Policy, the US, the US Pivot and India's Foreign Policy, A Handbook of Indian Defense Policy, India's Afghan Model, and the US-India Nuclear Pact Policy, Process, and Great Power Politics. Our host for the day is Dr. Shelley Johnny. Dr. Shelley is an assistant professor of political science at the St. Aloysius College, Thrissur, Kerala. He has held various research positions at the Center for Air Power Studies, the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA, and his research interests include contemporary West Asia, with a special emphasis on the Arab Gulf states, Iran, Iraq, and the Hezbollah, and the Afpak region. Within this region, his focus is on the nature and development of ongoing conflicts and the overall security and terrorism-related aspects. He is a senior fellow for West Asian and Security Studies with CPPR. A warm welcome to you all, and over to you, Dr. Shelley. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, thank, thank you, Purvajah. So, um, actually, uh, good evening to all. Uh, as we know, uh, the Taliban has captured uh, Afghanistan once again. Uh, but the situation is very different from what it was in the late 1990s and the uh, early 2000s. Uh, China was not so engaged in the wider region with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative as it is right now. And when it comes to India, India had a lot of options. Uh, I'm mean, sorry, not a lot of options, but besides uh, the Afghan Taliban, uh, we had the alternative in the form of the Northern Alliance, which is also supported by other powers such as uh, Russia and Iran. But now we know that such an alternative is not available within Afghanistan. And uh, Pakistan has much more leverage uh, within the country. So 
So in such circumstances, it would be very interesting to look at uh, uh, China and India's roles, uh, national interests and strategies in Afghanistan and the wider region. So uh, without much delay, I uh, invite Ambassador uh, Raja Mani to uh, deliver the uh, introductory remarks to this webinar. Thank you. I invite you. Uh, Hello, Raju, sir. Sir, you're on mute. Thank you, Dr. Shelley Johnny. Hello, Professor Harshpant. Thank you, Purvaja, for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join colleagues from the CPPR for this uh, discussion series on Afghanistan. Uh, my, my introductory remarks are fairly simple. Uh, what has transpired in Afghanistan uh, recently uh, is a huge setback for India. Uh, the biggest losers, uh, much more than India, are the people of Afghanistan, especially the women and the, the girls of Afghanistan. Uh, while uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty still remains within Afghanistan as to its future, uh, the Taliban uh, regime seems to be slowly consolidating uh, there seems there is little will in the international community to resist it uh, militarily. Uh, there is very little resistance. There was some resistance in Panjshir Valley, which seems to have petered out, if not, but may not have completely died out. Uh, in general, the biggest fear of the European countries is of a refugee uh, outflow, which also threatens them. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is happy that it has pulled out most of its people out of Afghanistan and uh, is determined not to lose any more lives in that country. Uh, even as we speak, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is meeting uh, and uh, a number of discussions are uh, happening there. I think all the countries in the neighborhood are worried about the implications of these recent developments, whether they will be refugee flows, whether Afghanistan will return to becoming a haven for terrorist, terrorism and terrorist groups from all over the world. India in particular has great concerns uh, in this regard. And for, for Pakistan, this obviously is a major political victory. Uh, to what extent uh, it was militarily involved, there have been a lot of allegations. Uh, we, we, the full details have to come out, but it is reasonable to presume that Pakistan military has also played a big role. So has the ISI, whose chief was in Kabul recently. As far as China is concerned, uh, I believe that the Chinese will see this as a uh, extraordinary opportunity for themselves. Most people have focused only on the interest that China has in preventing uh, the Etim terrorists from targeting China, and it will try to strike a deal with the Taliban in this regard. The Taliban is keen that the Chinese recognize the regime as well as provide financial and economic support, especially if the sanctions continue and the West uh, does not recognize them or does not release uh, humanity. The West has promised humanitarian aid, but other forms of assistance, the sanctions are not lifted. So China is an extremely crucial, powerful, and important partner. But beyond that, considering the global state of affairs, considering the tensions between China and the US, considering the uh, publicly declared intention of the US, that it is going to spend uh, more time focusing on the Indo-Pacific, uh, on uh, looking at what China does and countering what China does. I think China will certainly see Afghanistan as an uh, opportunity for it to expand, not just its economic influence, but also political influence. And by stabilizing Afghanistan, see if it can continue to present uh, an alternative to small uh, countries of the world uh, as a country which comes to their help, while the US is often diffident and reluctant or highly unreliable, as has been proven in the case of Afghanistan. So these are my opening remarks, and I'd be happy to take any questions as we go along. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I invite uh, Professor Harsh Pant to, uh, uh, to this webinar to uh, give his uh, understanding about the situation. 
Welcome, sir. Welcome, uh, Professor Harsh. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnny, and uh, thank you, CPPR, for having me as part of this discussion and uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to be part of a panel with Ambassador Rajagan. So it's wonderful to be here. Uh, of course, we are all talking about Afghanistan for the last few months now, and uh, this is something that will continue to be talked about for a very long time, given that uh, challenges are nowhere, uh, will not disappear anywhere in a hurry. Uh, and I, um, you know, I, uh, in, in some ways, uh, uh, Ambassador Rajabani has laid out very, very clearly, cogently, the, the, the sort of central premise of, of the discussion. I would slightly, uh, you know, uh, change the focus, if, if, if I may, in terms of uh, providing uh, or, or throwing out, uh, you know, uh, an argument uh, which perhaps from my point of view uh, is something that India should be pondering more about. And the argument is very simple that look, what has happened since 2001 is that American security umbrella in Afghanistan has actually been beneficial for India. Uh, it has been, been you know, in terms of uh, the certain stability that, that it provided, in terms of uh, the fact that India could really uh, uh, not worry too much about the Western frontier. That here was a, you know, here was a, the US with its vast uh, military resources uh, with varying degree of attention span perhaps, but I think the presence of American security in, in, in Afghanistan, security forces in Afghanistan, uh, to me, uh, you know, if you look at the evolution of a number of um, uh, Indian foreign policy maneuvers, it seems to have been a very productive phase. Uh, we have seen, for example, with ups and downs, how America diverged from Pakistan, we have seen the ability of India to stand up to Pakistan more strongly. Uh, uh, and we have seen uh, how India-US relationship also evolved. Of course, it was evolving uh, since the end of the Cold War, but post-2001, there was a new dynamic there. Uh, and the, you know, in, in the last few years, what we have seen, this is India's focus on being able to marginalize Pakistan in global discourse, I think has been a big achievement for Indian diplomacy that now no one really talks about India-Pakistan prism anymore. You know, we are in a different league. We know Pakistan's economy is smaller than the economy of even the city of Mumbai. We know that uh, you know, the, the challenges that Pakistan uh, poses to us, but I think Pakistan, has be Pakistan managed to become uh, marginal in, in the larger scheme of things, partly because of India's own rise, but also partly, I think, what was happening on, on India's Western frontier. So I would say that you know, when you look back at the last two decades, uh, those two decades have been pretty interesting in, in their own evolution. And I think the fact that it allowed India to rethink its role in the East, to me, is the biggest story of our times. You know, we were always bogged down in the Western theater. We were all, I mean, constantly this, this sense that Pakistan is a problem. For the last uh, 60 years, almost, it has been this obsession with Pakistan in Indian foreign policy, for right reasons, uh, perhaps. But I think the fact that it it did not allow India to emerge out of that straight jacket. Uh, that opportunity emerged in the last two decades. And I think that India and India played has played its cards well. You know, the, the fact that you could have an Indo-Pacific maritime space emerging, the fact that India could organically make a claim to its links with East and Southeast Asia uh, through its connections via BIMSTEC, the fact that India could ignore SARC and say, well, we are going to invest in Bay of Bengal and through Bay of Bengal, we are going to link up uh, to Myanmar and Thailand and make a claim that we are not outsiders to, to Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, we, no, one need, no one needs to invite India to Indo-Pacific. India is organically linked to the region. And in it, those are the claims are now uh, pretty much well accepted in the strategic community. But, but the, you know, there was a process through which India made those claims. There was a, uh, it, it was, it was, it, it took India time to convince others. And it took, of course, uh, in, in time to, it took India a lot of effort in convincing uh, the West that um, on, on major issues, uh, India's priorities are in sync with the West. So partly I think what happened on September 11, 2001, which changed the name of the nature of, the, uh, of, the te of terrorism from Western perspective uh, and brought West and India closer on the issue of terrorism. And, and partly how India played its cards vis-a-vis -vis its Eastern frontier and, and, and that allowed India to emerge as a, as, a, as a stakeholder in the kind of conversations we are having today. Um, you know, later this month we'll have Quad Summit. We have just seen what what has happened with the with the US and UK and and, uh, and Australia. I think there is a larger you know there is a larger game that is emerging. Of course, we we talk of the great game in Afghanistan, but to me it seems that I think the challenge for India would remain over the next few years 
if you know to break out or to continue to be uh, you know to, to manage its western frontier while at the same time managing to increase its footprint on the eastern frontier and i think that's that's not a very easy challenge uh, and that's not very going to be very easy for all the reasons that that i think have been talked about and one can one can imagine a situation that right now we are talking on you know when when you talk indian interests you talk of uh, basically uh, one three factors one is that emergence of jihadist groups across the world uh, who are drawing inspiration from taliban's victory in afghanistan they have been resurrected their ideology has been resurrected and they they find it they have found a new momentum uh, there is a new spring in their steps they they, they know that you know something major has happened that uh, a group uh, you know as fundamentalist as taliban has achieved something quite dramatic uh, and that would entail that india's internal security india's regional security would come under pressure there would be pressure on uh, on kashmir uh, and and of course this idea that china and pakistan which have been working together now as a two front challenge for india will both find uh, you know strategic depth now in, in afghanistan so i think there is a larger issue about uh, you know geo 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 strategy there is a larger issue of in india's internal security there is an issue of uh, you know india's external security so i think all those concerns remain but to, to i think to go back to my point that can india still manage to be part of the discourse on the indo pacific in ways that it has been able to do over the last few decades uh, over the last two decades in particular i think that will be in a, in a sense uh, the very uh, challenge for indian diplomacy uh, as to can we really uh, make manage this this turbulence that that is likely to emerge on the western frontier and and can can we not allow it to subsume or uh, you know our entire diplomatic efforts uh, in ways that perhaps would be detrimental to india's larger global aspirations so for me i think that question in a sense is one that that should drive indian foreign policy and strategic thinking because much as we think of afghanistan and pakistan as a problem my own assessment is that they are problems but they are problems that i think uh, we have managed well uh, uh, over the last few years and i think Uh, we have developed enough capacity uh, to deal with them over, in the future as well but the larger story is being written somewhere else and if we if we take our eye off the ball then i think the problems uh, might get um, exacerbated so thank you thank you professor pan uh, for your comments and uh, now it's it's quite interesting to look uh, at the afghan situation from the wider uh, perspective as you mentioned rightly and uh, i just i would uh, like to raise a question out here for uh, for both of our panelists uh what would be india's strategy in afghanistan and the wider region as part of countering pakistan's and china's attempts to keep india out of afghanistan so uh, maybe uh, ambassador rajamani can uh, go first and follow by sure. uh, um i think uh, india's strategy will have to depend upon how the situation evolves on the ground and what we see happening uh, within uh, afghanistan the uh, taliban regime consolidating uh, the kind of policies it adopts uh, how the international community reacts to these policies so we will follow a very calibrated uh, strategy of uh, we will wait and watch uh, and when we need to pronounce when we need to Uh, take a view when we need to intervene in, in whatever manner uh, we will do that so uh, the 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 words which have been commonly used are strategic pause or strategic patience i think these uh, words will continue and also wait and watch uh, these words will continue to dominate uh, indian uh, strategy and indian foreign policy thinking uh, towards afghanistan for some time because the dust just has not settled it is too early to jump to any kind of conclusions or to formulate uh, policies which then you may need you may have to reset but uh, starting from here uh, and to go on to what uh, harsh said just now uh, i would think that uh, while uh, undoubtedly the success we have had to the east uh, the indo pacific in particular are extremely important and have brought uh, brought india great dividends uh, over the last decade and two and while certainly the american presence in afghanistan was a big help for us uh, in a way we we were very proud and we exulted 
in what we had been able to achieve in 20 years in Afghanistan. We thought we had very effectively counterflanked uh, Pakistan. And though Pakistan was still uh, very much of a, a headache and a nuisance to us, we thought we had a strong option in Afghanistan to the west of uh, Pakistan, uh, which would keep it at bay to some extent at least. But how all those uh, reasons for happiness have unfortunately gone away with these uh, developments in Afghanistan. And uh, while it is easy to say that we must preserve the gains uh, to the East and we must keep our focus on it, I think uh, hard power realities uh, dictate otherwise. Afghanistan, uh, first and foremost, is going to uh, consume a lot of our time and energy. We are going to be watching very carefully uh, how, uh, what kind of control they have over their own territory, uh, what kind of uh, dominance the Haqqani network acquires within their regime, uh, how is it uh, going to affect the training of terrorists or uh, the, the groups in Pakistan and in Afghanistan who have been inimical to India. What kind of association do they have with the Taliban regime, with the Haqqani network? What freedom of operation do they get? And uh, how porous does the Durand line become? How porous does, uh, how much more porous does the India-Pakistan border become? Even though winter is approaching, so and normally uh, movement slows down in winter, but by the time spring and summer of next year arrives, uh, how much new ground would have forces inimical to India uh, gained uh, is something which uh, India will worry and very seriously watch. Um, Harsh mentioned about the rejuvenation uh, and the new enthusiasm that jihadi forces worldwide uh, will find. Uh, this will also have an impact uh, within India. We need to watch our domestic security situation very carefully. Uh, we need to uh, ensure that uh, we don't have opposing extremisms of two kinds. Uh, a Hindu extremism leading to an extreme uh, Islamic extremism or an Islamic extremism leading to a Hindu extremism and that creating social turmoil within our society and um, enabling a fertile ground for growth of more terrorism or for more recruitments into Afghanistan or into Pakistan in our neighborhood. We still have to wait and watch how much emboldened Pakistan will become with their victory in uh, Afghanistan. And once uh, Afghanistan stabilizes, if the Taliban regime stabilizes, countries start recognizing it, aid starts flowing, they establish full control over uh, their territory. Uh, what would be the next step that Pakistan would logically take? Uh, what would they do internationally in diplomatic forums? What would they do militarily on the borders? Once again, what will they, what policy or what approach will they take vis-a-vis -vis the proxy war uh, situation? Our tensions with China are still uh, undersolved. Uh, the, 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 there is an extraordinary concentration of armed forces of both sides on the border. Just today, the Indian and Chinese foreign ministers uh, met. Uh, the Indian foreign minister said the focus should remain on the border, uh, while the Chinese foreign minister gave the impression that India still has to go halfway to meet uh, Chinese demands. So there is, uh, even in official pronouncements, a significant difference in perception with the Chinese on the situation on the border like, and the pub public perception and the political pronouncement is one thing, the reality on the ground is something even bigger and different. So there are a lot of tensions underlying uh, that situation. And it is, it is by now very clear that uh, there is a great deal of distrust and suspicion which has emerged between uh, the political leadership of India and China, between India and China at all levels uh, of our uh, strategic foreign policy establishment. So how are we going to bridge it? Uh, is it going to come down? Is it going to grow? What other consequences will be there has to be seen. Uh, we, our neighborhood uh, is not uh, in the happiest situation uh, that uh, we would uh, like it to be. Uh, while uh, Bhutan or uh, Bangladesh still has good relations with us, uh, Nepal 
uh, is going through a phase of uncertainty with a lot of forces inimical to India there. In Sri Lanka, uh, the regime, the government uh, uh, has not been the best of friends uh, there to India. In Maldives, uh, we have had problems. Now the government is friendly, but uh, will they stay? How long will the situation continue? We do not know. Uh, will there be a spillover from Afghanistan into Central Asia? Needs to be watched. Uh, how will the situation in Myanmar evolve? Uh, the, the army, there's seen as of now, there is no signs of the army letting go of its uh, hold on power. How much more access uh, will this give uh, to China uh, within Myanmar? How much more influence will China get within uh, Myanmar? Uh, has to be uh, watched. So all these hard political realities today surround uh, India. And within these hard political realities, I really do not see too much time and luxury for a look uh, at the Far East, unless there is trouble there. And even if there is trouble there, uh, for example, uh, a conflict over Taiwan, a conflict uh, over the South China Seas, uh, tensions between uh, India, uh, between the US and China in the maritime sphere, uh, even if all of them happen, uh, what is the role that India can play? How much can we contribute? We can, we can be part of the quad and we can uh, create uh, a, a sense of a deterrence. We can create a, a perception uh, with the Chinese that we are all together and it is best that the Chinese do not make any trouble. But driven by their own interests, driven by their own confidence, uh, if they feel this is a strategically opportune moment to strike and to capture Taiwan, uh, will the US really stand up and defend Taiwan? Uh, is any other country going to be there for Taiwan? Is India really in a position to play a role? Similarly, with the South China Seas. So, so in all, I, I do not see the opportunity or the time uh, to look at uh, larger macro diplomatic issues. I think this is a time for us to be focused very much on the ground. Uh, we should not be driven by so-called uh, great power aspirations and ambitions, but instead uh, we must be absolutely clearly focused on building India into a fortress India, as the Americans made a fortress America, in defending our borders, in securing uh, our country, our territory, our society, particularly from terrorism in ensuring domestic harmony and uh, social stability and in consolidating our economy. Uh, uh, the, it, it is, it is wide, widely uh, accepted that the Indian economy is doing uh, fairly poorly, especially in the aftermath of COVID. Uh, we need to put a lot of energy into uh, rejuvenating our domestic economy if really, if we have to have the wherewithal to back our uh, great power ambitions. So uh, I, I think we are going into a phase where uh, we have to be inward looking. Of course, uh, the diplomatic activity is not going to cease. We will remain engaged with uh, everything that we have been doing. Uh, but the focus, the attention, the energy, uh, all have to be within in consolidating ourselves, in strengthening ourselves, and in preparing for eventualities like what has happened in, Ka in Kabul in other parts of our immediate neighborhood, or in uh, Pakistan being emboldened enough uh, to launch uh, some misadventure, or the Pakistani-China axis creating trouble for India. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Professor Pant, uh, should I repeat the question, uh, Professor Pant? No, no, I, I, I got it. Uh, I okay. think, uh, uh, you know, um, in terms of, uh, see, there is, uh, there, I, I, there is no denying the fact that ultimately a country or a nation uh, will have to uh, build its own resilience. Uh, and that's what uh, I think, uh, especially in the post-COVID COVID phase, you see all nations doing that. You see uh, whether it's West or whether it's East, most nations have turned inward looking. We ourselves are talking of Atmanirbhar Bharat. So I think there is an element of 
uh, inward orientation in almost every uh, in every country, partly because of the economic pressures and health pressures that have been generated by COVID, but partly also I think because that's how the the, the world is looking. Suddenly, you are looking at, uh, at the role that China is playing in your economy. Something those those issues that were not confronted for decades by the West. They are finding it difficult now to get out of that, you know, whether it's the dependence on supply chains uh, or on critical infrastructure technology. So I think we are going through a phase where almost uh, the, this idea of resilience and how to build domestic resilience will be at the top of, uh, of uh, every country's priority. Uh, in, in, in the context of Afghanistan, what I would say is that, uh, uh, look, I mean, since the question was largely whether India, what India's strategy should be, uh, I would you know, I would just say that, uh, do we know any other country that has formulated any strategy at this point? Almost all countries are looking at it, uh, given the rapidity of evolution, we don't even know what is going to happen tomorrow. Forget, I mean, if, you, if last week was, was about internal consolidation, this week, uh, from the very beginning, we heard uh, issues about internal disaffection within Taliban. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, given the rapidity with which Taliban have captured power, uh, and the, uh, I think no one really understands where this is, this, uh, all this is going. So I don't see particularly any need to for India to identify a definite strategy or a definite approach to this. I think we, we should play it as the, as the ground situation evolves uh, because that's what every country is doing. And I would also say that, you know, not, I mean, it might look, you know, there is this, is this idea that somehow uh, because uh, Taliban is in Pakistan's pocket, Pakistan is in Chinese pocket, somehow that's, uh, you know, that is going to be, uh, you know, the, the uh, redemption of Afghanistan, that somehow Afghanistan is going to become a modern nation state with, uh, with uh, Chinese resources. Uh, everything we know about China is that it's, you know, it does not do business like that. So I think uh, even, even for, for a country like China, which I think, uh, and Pakistan, these are early days. Uh, we don't, you know, I, I don't think there is, there is enough comprehension about uh, what Pakistan and you know uh, what role Pakistan? We know that it will, it's going to play, and it is playing a major role. But I don't think we know that in the larger context of Afghanistan, where different stakeholders are still present, they have not been reconciled. And the only way Afghanistan can have sustained peace if you if you have really a, if you undertake a political dialogue that has not happened. Uh, you know, even in Panjshir, it was bloodbath. Uh, you know, the the idea that you will have uh, a Taliban who has won. Uh, reaching out and then seeking political reconciliation with the with the uh, with the fighters or with the resistance movement that 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 has not happened. We have seen a government that is primarily all Taliban and their allies. So I, unless the the political structures move in a certain direction, uh, in a way which are which, you know which, this overused word inclusive, I don't see uh, how, you know how uh, we we can uh, you know we can discount the possibility. Of an undercurrent of continuous turbulence, continuous civil war in Afghanistan, civil war-like situation in Afghanistan. It would seem Taliban are in control, but underlying that, there is much that will happen. So I don't see any particular, you know, uh, any uh, any uh, immediate winner here. You know, the, the game. If, if it is a game, it has just started. Everyone is playing their own their cards, and we know that uh, you know everyone is anxious. Uh, uh, Central Asians are anxious. Russians are anxious. Chinese are anxious for their own periphery and what happens there. So, I, I mean, I, I would just say that in, in terms of strategy, I don't think India needs to worry too much about uh, having a, or formulating a, a, you know, a strategy at this stage because, um, uh, you know, uh, most strategies, uh, and if, if we were having this conversation uh, two months back, uh, we, would have, we would be having a very different conversation. Uh, no one had anticipated what happened in Afghanistan. So I think a lot of it is also about the, uh, unknown unknowns in Afghanistan, and I think let uh, and, and, and therefore uh, it's the strategic evolution, whether of India, whether of other countries, will take time. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, I, I don't see a particularly in particular imperative at this stage uh, to be having a, a clear strategy. I think a lot will depend on what happens on the ground and how things play out, how different actors play their own roles. And India can certainly India has the capacity to uh, to reshape. Or to remold its own role according to what happens on the ground. We have, you know, we know the region. Uh, we have invested in Afghanistan, um, and uh, we know all the all the major and major players. So I don't see particularly need for any uh, any you know any sketched out strategy at this stage. Certainly, it would depend on what happens on the ground.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Plant. Uh, I think we'll be having time for only uh, one more question before we take uh, questions from the floor. So a question is, uh, considering that there are different factions and diversity of opinion within the Afghan Taliban, um, how, uh, how successful will they be in keeping up with their promise of uh, containing the uh, East uh, Turkestan uh, Islamic movement in accordance with uh, China's uh, wishes? There's a question to uh, both of you. So Ambassador Rajamani, you can uh, go first. Well, uh, I would say that first of all, uh, there is uh, still very little understanding of the Taliban, of the factions within it, and uh, what is the interplay between them. We just saw uh, yesterday Mullah Baradar come out on television and say that all these media reports that he was uh, killed, he was or he was injured in clashes with the Taliban, with the Haqqani network, are all uh, false. So our understanding of uh, the internal workings of Taliban and the dynamics of various factions within it is still very limited. But having said that, uh, I think uh, in the relationship with China, there would be a broad unity unless there is an extreme, uh, extreme faction. Uh, it almost, it, it makes sense, it makes logic uh, for all factions of the Taliban to see China as a potential ally in the long run in facilitating and enabling them uh, stabilize their uh, control over Pakistan. So to that extent, uh, uh, a particular faction or the Taliban regime uh, supporting a chip against China uh, is not uh, a reality one in cases. But yes, even if the Central leadership says uh, crack down on ATIM, uh, control ATIM. Whether that will be carried out at the grassroots level, we do not know. How much, how uh, rigid is their hierarchy? How much control uh, does the leadership have over their uh, cadres? All that has to be still seen. So China has extracted promises. Uh, China has uh, put forward incentives, uh, it has laid carrots in front of Taliban, and the Taliban has shown eagerness and enthusiasm to accept uh, the Chinese offers. They want China to be one of the first countries to recognize them. This whole dynamic is under play. We haven't heard much from Etim uh, in this period, so we will have to wait and watch uh, as to how that uh, plays out. But uh, as long as Taliban the whoever is right now in power remains the dominant force within Taliban. Clearly, they are trying to play a tango with the Chinese, and the Chinese will also play ball with them. They are trying to see what are the terms of engagement, what is the mode of engagement. The, 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 we still do not know if the Chinese will actually recognize. But short of recognition, there probably already is a great deal of engagement. And that engagement will steadily grow. The Chinese are extremely pragmatic people. They do not go by uh, formalisms, uh, formal recognition, non-recognition, sending of an ambassador, uh, inviting, exchanging delegations, inviting delegations. These are not important. As long as there is activity, there is progress on substance in consolidating that relationship and the Chinese have something to gain out of it. Uh, the Chinese ask is that ATIM be prevented, and then they are interested in the resources, the copper as well as other minerals of uh, Afghanistan. And uh, beyond that, uh, they would not want to see a civil war. They would not want to see uh, conflict continuing uh, within Afghanistan. And to the extent uh, they can help consolidate uh, the regime, uh, establish peace uh, and stability across the country, they will try and support that. So I think this is still a process which is evolving, but the broad trend and the broad direction is uh, already clear. And I only see more movement uh, in that regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Pant, uh, if you could uh, give your comments. Sorry, I, I will just um, I'll just add you know that in some ways uh, you know it's very difficult uh, while uh, you can have a you can have a, an informal arrangement that look uh, I will give you resources I will give you recognition uh, or legitimacy and uh, I will support you uh, globally um, so long as uh, you know uh, you don't bring your radical elements to my side uh, I think uh, you know that. 
that can be an informal understanding but you know if you if you know anything about radicalization or if you know anything about extremism of this kind it uh, i don't think it respects boundaries like this so i think there is a reason why everyone is worried because the idea that you have taliban in power means as as uh, you know as we were discussing earlier uh, that a whole host of groups are rejuvenated it's it's an ideological re- you know uh, rejuvenation it does not matter whether uh, taliban will say well formally we will not do this or that of course uh, you know they in the in the short term at least they have an interest uh, in getting china on board but that doesn't mean that ideologically china will not start facing the pressure we know the kind of pressure china is facing on cpec uh, in pakistan you know, they are they are, they are they are being attacked uh, almost uh, on a weekly basis till, till till a few weeks back and i think you know there is a, there was there are reports about um, 40 to 50 odd companies out of 130 odd companies wanting to get out of uh, of pakistan so i think there is a you know those are also the realities that china is facing and uh, and uh, you know much as uh, uh, i think uh, india is, is is under pressure chinese are also under pressure so so they know and uh, that they are, you know that these kinds of consequences they will also face irrespective of what the taliban say you know will say or will not say so i think that that is also something one needs to take into account that extremism radical you know of this kind uh, does not really be can be managed within boundaries or within borders it, it you know there is a logic to its expansion and that expansion happens uh, ideologically you can't really contain that uh, and the taliban's victory itself is is a is a great morale booster so uh, in the end what taliban's leadership may or may not, may not be able to do is beside the point of what happens within pakistan and we know that uh, sorry within china and we know that uh, egm fighters have been found everywhere uh, and they have gone you know and so so china comes to terms with them uh, with the with those governments and they have tried to bring them back or they have tried to manage that that problem but this problem has gotten aggravated by the fact that taliban are in power uh, and there is no other way of of of, of you know of cutting uh, this particular slice Uh, and so i think the best bet is now to engage with the taliban which they are doing uh, and hope that taliban are able to uh, give them the kind of leverage the kind of space uh, that they that they would give so again we will, we will see what happens okay thank you thank you uh, i think uh, we'll just uh, touch upon one last question that is uh, basically what is the likely impact of the afghan taliban's support for the uh, kashmir issue and how uh, how can india contain any kind of fallout from uh, this kind of uh, support professor rajamani oh, sorry i bazar rajamani ambassador <laughs> and professor professor and ambassador which we yes yes, yes. yeah <laughs> uh, well i, I think it, it for it, it, it follows on the same lines as what uh, we were talking first of all we have to wait and watch Uh, our uh, security forces are uh, confident that they have a uh, tight lid on kashmir and uh, they can uh, prevent or control uh, anything from happening there but that doesn't mean uh, efforts will not be made uh, for terrorist attacks and uh, so far in public pronouncements the taliban has only talked about political support uh, for the separatist movements or islamic movements in kashmir uh, we 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 really do not know what i, I don't once again that i anticipate the taliban uh, publicly uh, trying to support uh, a militant uh, extremist uh, movement in fact even uh, pakistan uh, protests that it doesn't uh, it is actually fights terrorism and it doesn't support terrorism in any manner and these terrorists Uh, elements are all independent on state actors uh, which are beyond their control nobody believes that and it is not true but at least that is the public claim so the why should the taliban uh, take a different tack in this this so called taliban 2.0 version but uh, here again i would uh, put emphasis on uh, the point that i made earlier which is uh, it is a time for india to focus within it is a time for india to build uh, ourselves into a fortress india and for that purpose it is important that we have a dialogue with the people of kashmir we find a solution to the political problems in kashmir and we do not uh, create or we do not permit kashmir to deteriorate into a situation where the people from outside whether it is pakistan whether it is the taliban regime or china or anybody else has an opportunity to 
uh, intervene there or to interfere there. So the, the, the process of political reconciliation, political dialogue, winning the hearts of the Kashmiri people always remain relevant, are always important. And that is something which India needs to do purely out of its own internal necessity in order to consolidate and build our strength within the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Professor Pan. Uh, no, I have nothing more to add. I will just say that I think uh, more than Taliban now, and more than uh, I think external forces, it is, uh, I think it is uh, how India develops its own ability to, uh, to manage some of these uh, problems internally uh, and how it develops uh, its ability to counter it, for example, uh, both uh, within Kashmir as well as at the, at the border level, what kind of uh, measures we have taken. I think on, on that would depend how far they are able to do it. Because I think, you know, compared to 1990s, this is also a different environment. It is, it is also a different, uh, I mean, we know, the, uh, you know, the revocation of Article 370 has also given Indian state greater operational control. Uh, so, and, and the situation within Kashmir is today not the same as it was in the 1990s. So I think the, the, the ability of the of outsiders to create that kind of a problem uh, perhaps is not that high, but what is important is whether within India, within the ge geography uh, that, that we are concerned about, we have enough operational control, both vis-a-vis uh, -vis the human-centric approach as well as the instrumentalities available at the borders, uh, which, which I think Indian uh, state will have to figure out a response. Uh, but uh, by and large, I, you know, uh, in, 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 in that sense, this is not so much a question of what Taliban can do or what Taliban's rise can do uh, or what they can do directly, but a more a question of what a, a victory of, of, of this kind of a regime means uh, in terms of uh, ideological dispersal, as well as the ability of some groups within India to make use, may take advantage of that. And so if that happens, then I think India, in, in Indian government or Indian policymakers also need to be receptive to the challenge that will come organically. Uh, and uh, and that those are some I think some of the things that will matter not so much as uh, Afghanistan trying to create or as Taliban trying to create um, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, make a deliberate push in, in, in creating uh, problems in Kashmir. I think it's it's more about the larger ideological problem in the region than than anything else. Thank you. Purvaja, I think we can take uh, questions from the chat box now. So uh, we can uh, raise uh, a few questions from the chat box since we are done out here. So, uh, uh, yes, sir. thank you, Shelly, sir. Thank yeah. you, Shelly, sir. And uh, thank you to both our uh, speakers for such interesting comments. Um, I'll go now read out some of the questions from our participants. And uh, the first question uh, comes to you from uh, Mr. K.V. Thomas, who is a scholar affiliated with CPPR. So he uh, asks you that in the wake of the withdrawal of the U.S. from Afghanistan, how far, far will the new policies of the Biden administration, such as the trilateral security cooperation of Australia, U.S. and U.K., ensure India's strategic interest, especially because of differences in, within the Quad and other countries of the Indo-Pacific region? He hasn't specified who this is for, so maybe, uh, Sherry, sir, you could pick who could answer this. Um, I, uh, am I already, yeah, 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 anyone can answer, I think. Uh, uh, well, let me, let me straight away say that this uh, trilateral uh, agreement, I don't see it as uh, having... Uh, any direct uh, benefit for India or uh, impact for India. In fact, that uh, the merits of that uh, agreement it's itself uh, uh, still uh, being examined closely because it was a secret agreement. It has just come out. We know France is very upset and angry. But beyond that, uh, there has also been comments that uh, what is being transferred is out outdated uh, technology, uh, that this is more a commercial deal uh, rather than anything else. Uh, and uh, that the future of military warfare, uh, like uh, in the air, is going to be drones and unmanned uh, vehicles. Uh, it is no longer submarines. Uh, so, uh, though this, these are missile capable uh, submarines, and submarines, and to that extent, uh, they are important. I don't see it having any direct impact on India or uh, India's security. 
But on the other hand, uh, clearly the Chinese are very upset uh, over this development. Uh, they have used stra strong language to criticize it. They have talked about uh, the beginnings of a new arms race uh, within the region. Uh, they may try and respond uh, in, in some manner or not uh, some manner or other, we do not know. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, a North Korea crying for attention from uh, the major powers of the world, shooting missiles into uh, the sea. Uh, I think the Chinese have also criticized India for missile tests that uh, we are planning, uh, which will also have the capability of targeting a large number of uh, cities in China. So overall tensions, we see tensions growing while we have all these headaches on the Western front, uh, the US, uh, initiative, the US-UK-Australia pact, uh, new nuclear submarines uh, coming to Australia, uh, all are going to add to tensions in the region, which are probably unwanted and unnecessary at this stage. Thank you, Ambassador Rajamani. Uh, the next question uh, is from uh, Bijoy Sebastian, and maybe Professor Pant can answer this. And uh, he asks that uh, New Delhi has already avoided taking the risk of militarily supporting the resistance forces or the democratic government forces after the Feb 2020 deal under Trump. Recently, we have engaged the Taliban via its political office in Doha, falling short of options. So considering India's economic interests, can New Delhi still afford to hesitate to talk directly with the Taliban and also be a key regional actor? If yes, what is the rationale for this continued policy of wait and watch? And how long can we wait and how can we uh, incapacitate a potential Taliban-China-Pakistan access on, pragma on pragmatic lines? Professor Pant? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I, I don't really uh, know what, you know, we, we talk of economic interests, uh, uh, but I don't really know what those economic interests are. Uh, certainly, I think, uh, you know, when, when, when you had a stable government in Afghanistan, uh, I think most of the things that India did were uh, more in terms of infrastructure building and capacity building, uh, which, uh, which were aimed directly at helping the Afghan people. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, what in terms of economic returns, I'm not so sure what India was looking at, I mean, apart from the fact that it, it generated a lot of goodwill for India. Uh, so I don't know what, uh, you know, uh, whether there are any economic, you know, there, there are, our economic stakes in Afghanistan are so high uh, that uh, we need to take a call right now, uh, here and now. Uh, I, I think that by and large, uh, what, what has happened is that uh, a, new, a new regime has come into power in Afghanistan and uh, Afghanistan is a neighbor, whoever will come. Um, by whichever means India would have to engage with that regime uh, so that the, the, you know, the, the engagement that happened um, is, is a natural sort of an extension of that, that what do you do if you have a new government and you need or a new regime, you need to you know, engage with them. Although it was interesting that the press statement said that that, that engagement happened on the behest of uh, Taliban. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, this is something that, that as a practical necessity, India will have to um, engage with whoever is running Kabul, whether it is for evacuation of its own nationals uh, or some of the other interests in the short to medium term that India will have. But as we have discussed, I don't see the particular hurry uh, to, you know, to, you know, let's say tomorrow we come out and say, well, we, we are recognizing the government in Kabul. What would it, how would it matter? What would it do, do for India? Uh, are suddenly, Talib, you know, suddenly Taliban is not going to become pro-India suddenly Taliban are not going to uh, give us advantages in Afghanistan that are going to be distinct or, or more substantive than, they are, than the Chinese are being offered. So I think uh, one also has to be realistic that India's historical and traditional stance uh, on Afghanistan had always been uh, of a certain kind. And with the, with the military rise of Taliban and military victory of Taliban, uh, a new dispensation is there. Uh, there are practical issues on which you will have to engage with whosoever is in power. Uh, and beyond that, uh, I don't think there is any particular hurry to move forward uh, in legitimizing Taliban at this stage. We can, again, uh, see how things evolve. Uh, this, this is still too early. And I, and I, 
um, you know, often uh, there is a lot of, dis- you know, uh, there is a lot of despondency about uh, this this issue that somehow it's all doom and gloom. Uh, you know, everything has collapsed and nothing is going to move and you know, Afghanistan is gone and this, I, I, maybe I'm uh, optimistic by disposition, but I, I, I don't see that need for uh, being so uh, gloomy about the fact that you have a Taliban regime in power. I think India is a major power in South Asia. Uh, it will deal with it uh, on its own terms. I don't think we should be particularly paranoid about uh, you know what uh, what the Taliban are up to. They will have a f- we know what they are up to, and they, we, there is a great degree of awareness about what Taliban want. But at the end of the day, I think this is also to be recognized that India of 2021 is not the India of 1990s. So uh, uh, why should we always be on the defensive and say well you know everything is collapsing around us? There are many things that are happening. There are challenges always. There has never been a golden period of, uh, of India's presence in the neighborhood. Uh, so I find it difficult to accept the logic that suddenly now we are facing a peculiar time. India's neighborhood has always been very turbulent. India's neighborhood has always had ups and downs. Uh, and uh, I think it is for Indian diplomacy to find ways of managing that turbulence. So uh, Afghanistan will uh, happen. It, it has happened. Something has happened. The Taliban have come to power. Uh, I think India is a major, major player, a major power in the region. Uh, Will deal should deal with it on, on its own terms. Why should we allow Taliban to set the terms of engagement for us? They have come to power. Uh, good for them. Good for China. Good for Pakistan. Let's see how they sort it out. Well, uh, on that note, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pant, for that um, you know optimistic uh, take on what India should uh, what India should do. So uh, bef- it's uh, we're almost out of time. So uh, before I uh, close, uh, Dr. Shelley, would you like to give uh, some concluding remarks, or you know, uh, also thank the two speakers from your end? Yeah, um, I-, I would like to uh, first. I would like to thank both Ambassador uh, Rajamani and Professor Harshpan for a very, uh, a, a, a very nuanced. Understanding, providing a, a very nuanced understanding of the entire situation of uh, uh, the uh, the Taliban's second coming to Afghanistan and what are uh, uh, the interests of both uh, uh, China and uh, India. So I, I think it's it's, it's a very uh, they have dealt with a whole host of issues and and there are two takeaways as far as I'm concerned with. Uh, by listening to both of them. One is that unlike the 1990s and the early 2000s, the present situation is very much uh, linked to the larger context, that is uh, India and China's context in the Himalayas, the Indo-Pacific region. So, so it's, it, it, it's a much larger uh, 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 playground that, that we're looking at uh, right now. And, and uh, secondly, a very simplistic understanding of the China, Pakistan, Taliban axis is not uh, the ground level picture. There are lots of complexities involved, especially diversity of opinion uh, uh, and, and groups within the Afghan Taliban, diversity of opinion within Pakistan on how to look at China and, and how uh, what kind of challenges that China is likely to face with uh, uh, this region. And also, finally, the changed circumstances in Kashmir. That is, it's not the same as it was in the 1990s, but we have a very different situation at the ground level in Kashmir. So how much can the Afghan Taliban impact upon uh, the situation in Kashmir has also been, I think, problematized by Professor Pan very uh, effectively. So, uh, and also, as Ambassador Najar Mani has mentioned, uh, the different kinds of extremism that is, uh, be it uh, the uh, Afghan Taliban or the Pakistani variety or the Hindutva within India, uh, how all of these extreme, uh, uh, extreme ideologies can complicate our process to stabilize the region has been very wonderfully put forward by Dr. Raja. So I would like to thank both our panelists today for giving a very nuanced understanding of this very complex uh, issue. So I uh, I would like to thank them both. And with that, I would like to conclude my remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shelley, for uh, moderating the discussion so well. And thank you to both our uh, speakers, Ambassador Rajamani and mm-hmm. Professor Harsh Pant, for your interesting insights on the developments in this region. A big thank you to our participants for logging in today and listening so intently and for your questions. Um, I'd also like to thank our organizing team at CPPR. A special shout out to Vinny, 
for brainstorming and for conceptualizing this webinar series. To Joseph, Neetu, Sri Arvind, Rajesh, and Jerry Dia for putting this event together. And to Dawson Sir, Paul, and our chairman, Dr. D. Dhanuraj, for your insights and guidance as we conceptualized and prepared for this webinar. With this, I'd like to formally close today's proceedings. We will be back soon for the third webinar of the series. The date, topic, and speakers will be announced on our social media pages shortly. Good evening and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.